Hi, welcome to session 12 of History 3375, CIA and the Third World. Today's session is the last session in which we're going to cover new material because the next session, session 13, which is the final one, will be a review of some of the key points that we brought up during the course and then the second half of it will be a brief review session to help prepare people for taking the final exam. Now today's session also is different in the sense that the format we've been following for so many weeks looking at specific interventions in individual countries with a historical background and then the actual intervention, that's all going to change today because of course we're looking at the age of terror and specifically we're going to look at two particular aspects. One is the issue of, of course, 9-11 and the threat from Al-Qaeda and what was the role or non-role of intelligence in that whole process and in the reaction to it. And then secondly, looking at another aspect of what has been termed at least part of the war on terror, which was the invasion of Iraq. And we're going to specifically look again at intelligence and what it had to say about weapons of mass destruction as a primary reason for invading Iraq. Now, with that said, there are strong similarities to a lot of the things that we've been covering in the course because what we're going to be looking at is the issue of intelligence analysis, something that we talked about early on in the course, something that has periodically played an important role, whether it was in the Bay of Pigs and ignoring that information in Vietnam, the question of the uncounted enemy. Well, now we're going to come back and really focus on intelligence analysis in this last significant new segment of the class. And we're going to also be looking at, in that context, another issue that we hit upon what we were talking about the institutional history of the CIA and that is the bureaucratic infighting, the competition between various agencies of the US government and especially the FBI and the CIA, an issue that became of paramount importance in terms of the events that led up to 9-11. Now, to begin with, we're also going to be looking at some historical background and I've touched on this before when we talked about the Iranian intervention way back when we were beginning our uh, discussions of individual interventions. We are going to look at Islam again, uh, looking at what are the sources of Islamism or the sort of extreme version of Islam that has contributed to the development of terrorism. As we do this, I think it's very important to keep in mind, given the current context of our own society and our relationships with the world, that this isn't an attempt to describe Islam as the source of terrorism uh, any more than it would be if we said, well, we want to look at Western culture and see what the roots of fascism and communism are. Because both of those movements, those extreme movements, are deeply rooted in Western culture. So in trying to analyze them and understand the historical background, we're not criticizing Western societies. We're simply saying, well, what were the characteristics of Western societies that contributed to the arrival or the emergence of these kinds of ideologies? So too, when we look at Al-Qaeda and the ideas of Islamism and its rejection of Western influence, we want to see what is it within Islamic society that would help give rise to those kinds of forces. And if we look at the first slide, uh, in terms of the historical background of Islam, it's fairly straightforward in terms of the emergence of Islam in the 7th century or the 600s on the Arabian Peninsula. The fact that a new and vibrant religion would emerge at this time and in this place is quite understandable because the Arabian Peninsula was a major intersection for trade routes throughout North Africa, Europe and Asia at this time. So there is a great deal of coming and going of merchants who are themselves usually deeply committed to a particular religion, who are usually well read and often spend their time as they meet each other on these trade routes discussing ideas of religion. So in many ways the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East in general as we term it today was an intersection point for a variety of religious beliefs, including Christianity, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, etc. And it is hardly surprising that 
Islam would emerge out of this very vibrant intellectual environment and would have as its prophet a man who was himself a merchant. And that is, of course, Muhammad. And it is with his visions in 610 that Muhammad gains the inspiration to begin the religion of Islam. One of the things that it's important to distinguish about Islam, even though it has many characteristics in common with Christianity and other religions, such as its monotheism, such as its ideas of an ethical basis of human behavior. In other words, there is right and there is wrong, there is sin, there is punishment for it. Besides those commonalities, one of the distinctive features of the Islamic faith is the idea that it is an all-encompassing faith. That means that it goes beyond simply laying out basic precepts for ethical behavior. If you look at Christianity, for example, and Judaism with the Ten Commandments, you know, the basic strictures uh, for behavior for people who are adherents of those religions. Similar kinds of ideas are contained in the Quran, the basic holy book of Islam. But Islam is far more complex than simply a simple set of precepts. In fact, a whole set of Islamic laws are set out, known as Sharia, so that there are clear dictates not only about what are the basic ethical principles of this religion, but specific behaviors are instructed, are forbidden. There are observations and rules about the functioning of business, about relationships between the sexes. This is a highly complex set of guidelines and principles. And the importance of this is that it envisions a or an Islamic society. In other words, a society that is fully imbued with these principles and ideas. And as we will see, that's very distinctive, especially in the past 500 years, from what developed in the West in terms of how society was seen and what forces were seen as dr driving society. Now, another important fact to be aware of is the basic split within Islam that occurs at the time of the stewardship of Muhammad's nephew, Ali. During his time, a basic split developed in Islam between those who supported Ali and his vision of Islam and those who opposed it. Basically, and again, there is a great deal more complexity here than I'm getting into, but basically it was an issue over who should rule in Islamic societies. Ali's position was that those who rule in Islamic societies should be the descendants of the prophet. At the very least, they should be religious figures. Those who followed Ali's principles are known as Shiites. Those who opposed them and felt that non-religious figures could and should rule over Islamic societies were known as Sunnis. The Sunnis supported the idea that sultans, who might be military leaders, for example, could be the rulers of Islamic societies. And Sunnis composed the majority of the population in a variety of modern Middle Eastern countries, from Turkey to Saudi Arabia to Jordan, etc. The Shiites, who supported Ali's idea about religious leadership and the importance of it, are a majority in Iran and in Iraq. Now, the distinction is important to the extent of understanding some of the dynamics of Middle Eastern politics. But what's important to understand as well is that both of these groups still believe in the vision of an Islamic society, a society that is fully informed by, governed by, the principles of Islam. That's a very different position than what emerges in the West. Although Western societies would largely describe themselves as Christian societies, the fact is Western societies are secular societies.
In other words, Western societies like our own believe that the basic principles upon which laws are written, upon which political decisions are made, upon which education is based, that those principles should be secular principles. In other words, they do not incorporate religious beliefs. Secularism looks at the world and says, look, we understand certain basic scientific principles that help us understand how the world works. There are rational approaches of thought that help us interpret and understand the world. And we see this in academic disciplines. Those are the principles upon which we base our political system, our educational system, etc. Yes, people are religious and have religious beliefs, but that's largely confined to the ethical side of human behavior. It does not dominate in the political sphere, the educational sphere, the academic sphere, etc. Two very different visions with the largely secular Western societies here and Islamic societies which see themselves and insist that indeed Islam be influential throughout the various institutions and activities of their systems. Now, with that said, we now need to look at some of the major political influences that have been important in the Middle East in modern times. Because, well, we can understand what the basic premises are of an Islamic society. The fact is that there have been various contending ideologies that have put forward a vision of the future for the Islamic societies of the Middle East. These emerge effectively during a time of crisis in the Middle East. Beginning about 1300, the Ottoman Empire, which was centered in what's modern day Turkey, but dominated virtually all of the Middle East, except for Iran. The Ottoman Empire, which dominated down through the centuries, began weakening and moving into a process of decline, certainly by the late 1600s, and would eventually collapse at the end of World War I. So one of the universal principles that sort of governed societies at this time, that there was essentially a single recognized government through most of the Middle East, was going into decline during this period and eventually would collapse, and that's when the Middle East would fragment into a series of independent states. The other factor is that increasing Western influence with these secular principles that I've talked about in the form of Western merchants, in the form of Western invasions, the occupation, for example, of Egypt in the 19th century by Europeans. These Western influences began to challenge some of the basic precepts of Islamic societies. At the same time that this is going on, and we're talking about the late 18th through the 19th, early 20th century, at the same time that these challenges are going on as the Ottoman Empire weakens and then collapses, as Islam faces challenges from uh, the ideas of the West that diverge in significant ways from Islamic beliefs, there is also an effort to incorporate Middle Eastern societies into the larger world economy. The commercialization of agriculture, the development of agricultural estates to produce export products. That process led to significant displacement of peasant populations, in other words, peasants losing their land. And it also led to growing disparities between rich and poor. So as we get into the late 19th, early 20th century, there are a series of stresses that are building up and will continue to develop uh, throughout the 20th century in the Middle East, between the disintegration of the old centralized political authority, challenges, to the belief systems of Islam and growing poverty and disparities between rich and poor, all of these factors are placing stresses on Middle Eastern societies. One of the solutions that is offered 
to these problems is what we call secular nationalism, an idea that largely was premised on Western ideas of nationalism. In other words, that the institution which needs to be formed to face these challenges and to solve problems is the nation state. And we see here on this next slide a series of examples of such secular nationalist systems. Now, when I say secular, let me be careful here and point out that these movements would all still say, look, we believe in Islamic societies. We are Islamic. For example, the Ba'athist, who I mentioned here, they said, we recognize Islam as the dominant religious influence in our societies. But their focus was on creating a nation state, similar in form, at least, to the kinds of nation states we see in the West, such as our own. In Egypt, the National Party and the Mustafa Kamil in the 1880s. In Syria and Iraq by the 1940s, the Ba'athist Party. It's the party that Saddam Hussein belonged to. It was a highly influential party and governed both of these countries at one time or another. And then in Egypt in the 1950s, the Egyptian military officer whom we talked about early in the course, Gamal Abdel Nasser, again proposing an idea of Arab nationalism, pan-Arabism, but again the focus on creating modern nation states. Not dismissing Islam, but basically relegating it to a secondary position. In addition to those approaches, like the Ba'athists and Nash's ideas that dominated in countries like Iraq and Egypt, another solution largely imposed by the European powers after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire was a restoration, or in some cases, simply a creation of monarchies. If we look at Saudi Arabia, we look at Jordan, and for a time, Iraq, in all of these countries, monarchies were installed by France or England to serve as the stabilizing political institution. And like these other groups, the monarchies generally pressed for modernization of their societies. Yet, for both the nationalists, like Nasser, and the monarchists, like the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, the fact is that while they were able to generate, depending upon the country, considerable oil wealth, it is also true that their societies remain deeply impoverished with high levels of unemployment and high levels of poverty and great disparities between rich and poor. So whether it was the nationalists, as in Egypt, or monarchists like Saudi Arabia or Iran, the fact is both groups, as we get into the second half of the 20th century, have really failed to solve some of the basic problems of their own societies despite the generation of considerable oil wealth in a number of these countries. That's a set of conditions that help give new life to another approach to solving these problems. The idea of Islamism, of a stress, a return to an emphasis on the importance of Islam in society as its guiding principle. The idea of Islam as a community of faith, that what's to be the organizing principle of our society? Well, we reject the nation state as the most important thing. We reject monarchy. Instead, we say that it is Islam itself that is the most important guiding principle, the institution around which we want to organize our societies. These ideas have deep historical root in the Middle East. The most well-known of these movements was the Wahhabi movement, which emerged in the 18th century on the Arabian Peninsula, the same place where Saudi Arabia is located, and challenged the Ottoman Empire at this time. Challenged the Ottoman Empire because it, in the minds of the Wahhabis, was not sufficiently emphatic in enforcing Islamic principles and laws that they failed to live up to the high standards 
that the Wahhabists had in terms of a strict enforcement of Sharia, of Islamic laws, Islamic codes and customs. These ideas continued to flourish, although often below the surface, in the Middle East down through the centuries. And here on the slide, I've cited an Egyptian intellectual who was one of the leading proponents in the 19th century of these ideas, Muhammad Abdu. And he really captured the essence of Islamism and this emphasis on Islam when he said, he who professes the Muslim faith ceases to concern himself with his race or his nation. In other words, we aren't emphasizing tribal connections. We aren't emphasizing loyalty to a nation state. We aren't emphasizing loyalty to a monarchy. We are emphasizing loyalty to the Islamic faith itself. That is the organizing principle of our society. That's what constitutes our community. And of course, within that, the strict enforcement of Islamic law. Again, these ideas continue to flourish. And here on this next slide, what I'm giving you is just some examples of movements that were Islamist movements and heavily influenced by people like Abdu and others. The Mohammedan Union in Turkey in the 1900s. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt beginning in the 1920s. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is still an extremely powerful and influential uh, political and social force that continues to challenge uh, the current government, which is based on Nasser's ideas of a nation state. Basically, Islamism was anti Western and anti Western to a considerable degree because it was anti secular, anti materialist. Islamism rejected these characteristics of Western societies. The emphasis on the idea that, well, you know, in a secular society, we say there are really two spheres of reality. And there's the here and now for all of us that's based on rational political ideas and intellectual concepts that guide our education systems, etc. And then over here is religion, where people exercise their spiritual and ethical beliefs. But the two only occasionally intersect. And certainly the religious is not going to dominate those institutions of society, such as political institutions and educational institutions. This is an anathema to the Islamists, who say, no, Islam, religion, must be the dominant influence in all these areas of society. These ideas take on a new momentum and energy in the second half of the 20th century as more and more people in the Middle East find themselves essentially disenfranchised. These nation states that have been created are not very democratic. There is not freedom of expression in them or in the monarchies. There is still underdevelopment, economic underdevelopment, and acute poverty as hundreds of thousands of people are forced out of the countryside into the urban areas. And for them, seeing the failure of the secular nationalists and the monarchists to solve these basic problems in their societies. And seeing themselves so often dominated by Westerners, many people will find the basic message of Islamism highly attractive. One of the places where these ideas erupts most forcefully in the latter part of the 20th century is in Iran. And we have talked about this case, of course, because we talked about the aftermath of the U.S. intervention in 1953 with the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini and the creation of an Islamic Republic. Iran is a Shiite country, and therefore Wahhabism, which we've been talking about as one form of Islamism, was not influential. But of course, within the Shiite segment of Islam, there has long been this emphasis on the importance of religious leaders having a dominant influence in society. So it wasn't a very large leap for Shiite clergy in Iran, highly critical of the Shah, this dictatorial modernizing figure who really fit into the monarchical pattern that we've talked about. It isn't difficult for the Shiite clergy to say, look at that. 
what we're getting here is corrupting influences from the West funneled in by this monarchy. We are the ones that need to take control. And indeed, and in creating the Islamic Republic, they do precisely that. The clergy come to power and dominate Iranian society as of 1979, and they enforce a strict interpretation of Islamic law in terms of relationships between the sexes, in terms of information flow from the outside and controlling the distribution of Western cultural artifacts, movies, etc., because they are seen as alien to an Islamic society. In many ways, the Iranian Revolution gave a prefiguring of the rise of Islamist movements elsewhere in the Middle East, testifying to the failures of the monarchical systems and also the nationalist systems to solve basic problems in these societies. Now, there are contemporary triggers, in other words, specific events or developments in recent decades that have further accelerated this process. In other words, people moving towards an Islamist point of view. One of them, of course, is the Arab-Israeli conflict. The perception among millions of people in the Middle East, millions of Arabs, that in fact Israel has come to dominate and persecute the Palestinians, occupying their territory, and then of course the Americans are seen as the allies and indeed the promoters of Israel. So here again, in the minds of millions of Arabs, is this is the West intruding upon us, using their power to force their position upon us to support this alien state, Israel, which is not part of our societies. When the Soviets invade Afghanistan in 1979, this comes as another threat. Now again, for Americans, we'd say, oh, well, you know, they're communists. We're not like them. But from the viewpoint of people in the Middle East, well, call it communism, call it capitalism. It's all secularist. It all espouses these Western views about the minimal importance, if not the insignificance, of religion, about the importance of following these rational codes that dictate political and other developments, economic developments in societies. So the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan is seen as another direct invasion of Islamic societies, just as bad or worse than what the U.S. was doing or seen as doing with Israel. When in 1991, the United States responds to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in the first Gulf War, and sends tens of thousands of U.S. troops to Saudi Arabia, this is seen as another abomination. Doesn't mean that people supported Saddam Hussein necessarily in his invasion of Kuwait, but to send American troops into Saudi Arabia that houses some of the holiest places in Islam and allow these people there was another betrayal of the Islamic faith and Islamic culture. And of course, much of it is blamed on the House of Saud, the rulers of Saudi Arabia. And this is another aspect of Islamism. It isn't just criticizing the Westerners, but also the rulers of these societies who have apparently made alliances with the West. In its most extreme form, Islamism looks to terror as a way of driving out the West and purging its own societies that have been corrupted by Western influence and corrupted by elites, whether they're monarchies or nationalists, doesn't make any difference, corrupted by these elites who have cooperated so closely with the West. So terror will be the answer to drive out the Western influence and ultimately topple these regimes that have cooperated with the West. As we well know now, and have known for some time, the United States becomes the particular target of Islamic animosity, or I should say Islamist animosity. After all, the United States has been the leader in the process of globalization, westernization over the last half century. The United States 
as much as we pride ourselves and see ourselves as sort of an ideal society, represents precisely those values that the Islamists most vehemently reject. We are seculars. We continue to debate the issue of hmm, religious influence in schools, etc., but the fact is, hmm, time after time, the answer is always looking. Religion belongs over here. Religion is not the basis of our laws. Religion is not the basis of our public education system. Religion is not the basis of our political ideologies and systems, etc. We're a society driven by a consumer economy. Consumerism that emphasizes the idea that achieving human happiness requires the consumption of material goods. We are materialists. We measure the value and worth of our own society and other societies based on how much in the way of material products they produce and how efficiently they do that. We emphasize competitiveness. We are the sort of poster child for westernization. And as such, a logical target, the logical top target for Islamists. And then, of course, there are the material realities that for more than half a century the United States has built its economy on cheap hydrocarbons uh, produced to no small degree from the Middle East. And while we may not be as personally dependent upon oil from the Middle East as other Western countries or other developed countries, nevertheless without that oil our whole system, our, the global system we have created would rapidly collapse. As a result of that very real concern about access to and control of oil in the Middle East, the United States has, of course, intervened militarily, most notably in 1991, but we have supplied enormous amount of weapons to other societies, to the militaries in Middle Eastern countries, as we will see, and we talked about this early in the course, we became involved in a massive covert operation when we felt that the Soviets were threatening the Middle East because of their occupation of Afghanistan. The U.S. has not hesitated to project its power into the Middle East in order to protect access to that oil. And at the same time, American influence has been pouring in in much subtle, more subtle, but also, from the Islamist point of view, equally revolting ways in terms of the influence of American popular culture television, films, and of course the internet. Ideas of, you know, scantily clad women, you know, prancing about that, you know, that's, you know, that's the way life is. That's what makes part of the good life. Uh, people engaging in relationships and moving from one relationship to another, one intimate relationship to another. You know, you watch typical sitcoms in the United States today. You know, that's a common pattern. Again, that's an abomination to look at relationships between the sexes in such a crude and, from their point, immoral way. So cultural influences have further inflamed the anger at the United States. Now, with some understanding of where Islamism has arisen from and what the triggering mechanisms have been for its resurgence, shall we say, in the second half of the 20th century, we need to look at how did this process, or this set of movements, because there are distinct movements here, evolve to the point where we're facing a significant threat from terrorists in the last part of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century. One of the critical events is the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Now, from the Soviet point of view, their invasion of Afghanistan in December of 1979 was meant to save a client state. In other words, the Soviets had long been dominant in Afghanistan. Didn't mean necessarily that it was a communist government, but whoever governed in Afghanistan basically had to be someone that the Soviets approved of. If you think of the United States and Central America, it's a similar kind of situation. Now, we're not 
hand picking a particular leader, but we know from experience and they know that you can't survive unless you're somebody that the United States finds as acceptable. When that system seems to be breaking down, and breaking down because it's being challenged by Muslim rebels, the Soviets become intensely concerned, even paranoid. From their point of view, the events in Afghanistan in the late 1970s are directly driven by the CIA and the purpose of the CIA in promoting this rebellion was to destabilize the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, of course, at this time incorporated a number of Islamic republics, and by that I mean small states that were part of the Soviet system where the majority of the populations, the overwhelming majority, was Muslim. And it had long been the fear, not only of the Soviets, but going back to the Tsarists before them, that instability in any bordering Islamic nation could easily contribute to and fuel rebellion in these Islamic societies that were part of the Soviet Empire. If you remember when we talked about Iran early in the 20th century, that the Tsarist regime sent its Cossack guard into Iran. Not because they really cared about what would happen to the Shah, but they feared what would happen if there was a rebellion in this Islamic society that bordered their own nation and the fear that that would contribute to widespread rebellion among their own Islamic populations. Well, the Soviets are reacting in the same way in 1979, and they believe that it's a CIA covert operation that they're dealing with designed to destabilize the Soviet Union. From the, so from the CIA's point of view, this is simply Soviet aggression. The Soviets are using this as an excuse to establish a beachhead, if you will, that will put them in close proximity to the oil-producing nations of the Middle East. Each side throws history out the window to focus on what they think is the immediate threat from the other. The Soviets ignore the fact that you know, the Americans are anxious to protect their interests in the Middle East, but they're not really anxious to go fiddling around with places like Afghanistan. And the CIA and the US ignore the fact that, well, the Soviets were bound to react that way, just as the Tsarists did before them, because they feared destabilization on their southern border. So each side sees the other as the aggressor in this situation. And the decision is made in the United States during the Carter administration to begin assisting the Muslim fighters in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen as they were known, by supplying them with weapons. And the CIA arranges for Egypt and Israel to open up their warehouses of weapons, many of them weapons produced in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Egypt has them because Egypt relied for a very long time on the Soviet Union for its military assistance, its military supplies, and Israel has them because they've been capturing them from various Palestinian groups over the years. And these weapons will be shipped to supply the Mujahideen and, of course, try to maintain a fiction that this is all uh, locally done, that these are weapons captured from the Soviets themselves. Now, when Ronald Reagan becomes president, Reagan is determined to do more than just annoy the Soviets in Afghanistan. This is part of his larger vision, as we saw in Nicaragua, to roll back communist revolutions. And that's how he sees Afghanistan. The Soviets have moved in, put in a communist regime, uh, and he's going to turn that back. We're not going to have any more of these communist revolutions. We've had it in China and Vietnam, etc. And these regimes have stayed in power decade after decade. Well, we're going to start rolling some of these communist revolutions back. Afghanistan is another example. And in addition, it's a great way to bleed the Soviets. Now, the Americans still believed at this time 
that the Soviets had deliberately prolonged the war in Vietnam in order to weaken the United States. And now they were going to turn Afghanistan into the Soviets' Vietnam by supporting the Mujahideen on a large scale. But this required the training of the Mujahideen in guerrilla tactics so that they could become more effective fighters against the Soviet occupying army, which of course had a huge superiority in weapons. Now, they don't want to carry out the training of the Mujahideen directly. Instead, it's going to be done indirectly through Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, Pakistani Military Intelligence, it's known as ISI. It is non-commissioned officers from Pakistani ISI who will be trained through the CIA to then go back and train the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. So the CIA organizes special forces troops to serve as trainers for these Pakistani sergeants, non-commissioned officers from Pakistani intelligence, who will then go back and train the Mujahideen. And all of this is done at Camp Peary in Virginia. Camp Peary is a place that's been used for decades by the CIA uh, for training in paramilitary activities and various spy technologies, etc. So this is where the training would take place for the Pakistanis, who would then go back and train the Mujahideen. That is why, right to today, if you question the CIA and say, well, aren't you, resp aren't you responsible for training all those Mujahideen? They say, oh, no, we didn't do that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> they didn't do it. They just trained the Pakistanis who did. Still need plausible deniability. <laughs> now, it becomes apparent as they begin raising the level of conflict in Afghanistan that the Mujahideen in and of themselves may not be a sufficient force because no matter what, uh, at least with the types of weapons they have at their command, rocket propelled grenades and um, automatic weapons, small scale artillery, etc., that they're still at a tremendous disadvantage. One thing they can do is increase their numbers. And one way of doing that is by recruiting additional fighters from outside Afghanistan. Afghans are not Arabs, but there are potential recruits to help fight the Soviets in any number of Arab countries in the Middle East. Among those who will help recruit in the Arab countries is a Muslim cleric who has been a part of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, an Egyptian. He's an Egyptian cleric, and he will preach at his mosques and other mosques, urging young men in Egypt and other Arab countries to go to Afghanistan and fight the Soviets. These people, tens of thousands of them, uh, will become known as the Afghan Arabs meaning precisely that, that they had been people recruited from Arab countries like Egypt, Jordan, etc., to go to Afghanistan and fight the Soviets alongside the Mujahideen. Now, even with all of this in place, with the training of the Mujahideen, with the arming of the Mujahideen, with the recruitment of Arab fighters to join them, the Soviets still enjoy a massive advantage in Afghanistan because of their command of the air and specifically their use of helicopters just as the US uses helicopters in counterinsurgency tactics. The ability of these helicopters to move in at precise points uh, to unleash enormous firepower through large-scale machine guns, <laughs> modern versions of Gatling guns, rockets, etc still gave the Soviets a major advantage hmm? as they could hop and jump over blockades that the Mujahideen might establish on roads and still strike at their bases. The answer came in the form of shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. And specifically, the version made in the United States known as Stingers hmm? that were far more accurate hmm? 
and more efficient than those made in Britain are in the Soviet Union. In 1986, the Reagan administration, at the urging of the CIA, finally, although this had been requested for several years, finally agrees to release the stingers and allow them to be distributed the Mujahideen. Now, if you wonder, well, why would there be hesitancy? Because some people even then said, you know, this sounds like a good idea, but you know, these things don't have to be aimed at Soviet helicopters. Someday, they might be aimed at us, and they're awfully efficient. And it wouldn't be that hard to shoot down even commercial aircraft, of course, with these kinds of weapons. But the decision was made. It's time to really make the Soviets pay, to really turn the balance of power in Afghanistan in favor of the Mujahideen. And indeed, from that point on, the tide of battle would shift inexorably in favor of the Muslim rebels and away from the Soviets, who indeed faced their own version of Vietnam. The cost of this war to the United States was $285 million a year. An equal amount was also being supplied by Saudi Arabia, which, of course, faced the same fear of Soviet influence and approximate position to the Middle East and to the Saudi Kingdom. So it's an enormously expensive operation that is undertaken, but of course it is paying dividends from the American perspective in terms of the severe damage being inflicted on the Soviet Union. And here is where we begin to see the involvement of Osama bin Laden and other figures who have become key parts of the Islamist assault on the United States and other Western interests. Osama bin Laden was the son of a very wealthy contractor who made his fortune in Saudi Arabia, was also a very devout religious individual, and was anxious to do his part to help fight the Soviet invasion after it took place at the end of 1979. It is out of his involvement in the fight against the Soviets that he will eventually create the terrorist network, Al-Qaeda, in 1989. Now, initially, Osama bin Laden's involvement in Afghanistan comes about because of the urging of Prince Turkai, who is the head of Saudi intelligence. The Saudis want to have an effective person on the ground to help funnel money and arrange training for the Afghan rebels. And Osama bin Laden becomes that key figure. He is personally asked by Prince Turkai, who knows that he is devout, knows that he has been absolutely enraged by the Soviet invasion of an Islamic country, that he asked bin Laden to assist in this process. And indeed, bin Laden himself will go to Pakistan, will periodically be in Afghanistan, will set up training facilities, will contribute some of his own wealth, to the training of the Muslim rebels in Afghanistan during these years, essentially during the 1980s. Finally, after a decade-long struggle, the Soviets essentially admit defeat and begin withdrawing their troops. And indeed, by the end of 1989, they had withdrawn the last of their forces from Afghanistan. However, this did not mean that the Islamic forces who had been fighting the Soviets immediately seized power. Far from it. A Soviet-backed government continued for the immediate future to survive in Afghanistan. And there was considerable factional fighting among the various groups who had been fighting the Soviets. So there is not a clear victory for the Mujahideen from the American and the Saudi point of view, though, 
the important thing is the Soviets are gone. That's the end of the threat. What happens to Afghanistan after that is <laughs> we don't really care. <laughs> That's the bottom line. But from Osama bin Laden's point of view, this is a betrayal by his own government and by the Americans because they have not seen to it that indeed a Muslim and Islamist government has come to power in Afghanistan. They've left the Mujahideen to fend for themselves. And this is one of the things that drives him to the creation of Al-Qaeda is the belief that he has in fact been betrayed. He returns to Saudi Arabia for a certain time, but finally, with certain discomfort growing between himself and the Saudi royal family because of his open and vociferous criticism of the regime and what it failed to do in Afghanistan, uh, he moved to the Sudan on the Horn of Africa in 1991. However, he didn't have to run out of Saudi Arabia. In fact, Prince Turkai, the head of Saudi intelligence, had made a deal with Osama bin Laden that he would be given time to liquidate his very substantial assets in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis would not pursue him as long as he stayed away and didn't make Saudi Arabia a target of his actions. So when bin Laden leaves and goes to the Sudan to live, where he will set up terrorist training camps in 1994, he is doing so essentially with the blessing of the Saudis, who don't want anything more to do with him. They just want him to go away. And if he wants to go blow up other people, that's his business. So the relationship between bin Laden and the Saudis mm -hmm whatever may be said, was in fact a fairly close one, even after 1991. And we will see more evidence of that later on. By 1994, bin Laden has begun setting up training camps in Sudan for his Al-Qaeda network. Now we have to look at the other significant piece of the puzzle in terms of the formation of Al-Qaeda. And that has to involve the nation of Egypt again. Abdel Rahman, the cleric who had helped recruit Arabs to fight in Afghanistan, is equally incensed with his own leader, President Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt. Particularly when Sadat arranged a peace agreement with Israel through the intervention of the United States during the Carter administration. So here is the president of Egypt making a deal with the Israelis, who of course all Islamists despise. So Abdel Rahman calls for the assassination of the Egyptian president. And in 1982, a group known as Islamic Jihad, there are several of them, by the way. This is the Egyptian version. Islamic Jihad does indeed assassinate President Sadat. And a number of people are thrown in jail from Islamic Jihad, including this man, Ayman al-Zawrahiri. Well, in prison, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was a doctor by training, came from a fairly well-to-do Cairo family, rises to the leadership of Islamic Jihad. And he, much like Osama bin Laden, is a committed Islamist, believing that indeed Islamic people must drive out the West and must topple the corrupt regimes that govern them and set up strictly enforced Islamic laws and tightly governed Islamic societies. Now, well, not all of the events that I've listed here can be specifically attributed 
to Islamic Jihad, one group or another. Nevertheless, these events illustrate the growing influence of Islamist thinkers and Islamist terrorist groups in the Middle East during the 1980s. So even as the United States is helping to fund the Mujahideen and the Afghan Arabs, helping to train them, Islamist groups in the Middle East are already busy attacking American interests because, yes, there may be a temporary alliance in our interest to get rid of the Soviets, the immediate threat, but that doesn't mean we still don't want to drive the Americans out of the Middle East. And in 1983 bombing at the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, six CIA officers are killed. They were at a meeting that day in the embassy. And when this enormous truck bomb went off, six of them were killed. Also in 1983, there's the bombing of the Marine barracks. U.S. Marines had been sent in to attempt to stabilize the situation in Lebanon. And 241 are killed in this bombing. And finally, in 1984, the new CIA station chief sent to Beirut after the killing of these six CIA officers, a man named Buckley, is kidnapped by terrorists in Lebanon. So we have a series of events in the early 80s indicating that there is already, even before Osama bin Laden feels betrayed by the Saudi government and the Americans, even before that's happening, there is another wing of Islamic or Islamist terrorist groups organizing these attacks on the United States in the 1980s. And they are taking on, of course, a very serious tone. Eventually, as we're about to see, the two elements are going to merge. Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda network, and Islamic Jihad and Ayman al-Zawahiri to form this larger Al-Qaeda network that becomes the ultimate threat to the US. In 1996, Osama bin Laden left the Sudan to go to Pakistan. Now, he left because the US had been pressuring the Sudan for some time to either turn him over to the US or to force him out of the country. The Americans are well aware of his growing animosity towards the US, his training of terrorists, etc., and they're looking for a way to control him, hopefully to arrest him and put him in jail. In the end, the Sudanese government's decision is simply, you got to leave. You know, we want you out of here. And they're hoping, in fact, at one point, there's discussion over whether the Sudan, Sudanese government actually offered to hand over Osama bin Laden to the US. But whatever the facts, the reality is he's allowed to leave in 1986 and go to Pakistan. Now there, he essentially renews, in some ways, his activities of the past. He works closely with Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, and with a faction of Islamic fighters in Afghanistan known as the Taliban. Since the Soviets had left, the Soviet-backed regime had indeed collapsed. But the various groups of Mujahideen who had been fighting the Soviets had splintered into a series of warring factions so that Afghanistan was torn by factional warfare year after year during the 1990s. Osama bin Laden allies himself with one newly emerging faction, the Taliban, which was made up particularly of young religious students who were rapidly gaining momentum and who eventually are able to defeat the other factions and take control of Afghanistan in September of 1996. Three pieces are about to come together. The victorious Taliban, the heirs of the various Mujahideen factions that had been fighting during the 1990s, Osama bin Laden, 
and his Al-Qaeda network. And Ayman al-Zarahiri, who has become or becomes bin Laden's principal advisor and merges Islamic Jihad with Al-Qaeda. So after 1996, we have an enlarged Al-Qaeda, including what Osama bin Laden had brought in. And now Zawahiri has brought Islamic Jihad into Al-Qaeda and now serves as bin Laden's top lieutenant. And Al-Qaeda has made its alliance with the Taliban. Now they have a state in which they can operate virtually without any inhibition or control as they help fund the Taliban government. And the Taliban government is in desperate need of funding because they're having constant problems internationally. So many of their policies are seen as dictatorial and restrictive of women's rights, etc. Uh, that they have a difficult time getting international assistance. But Osama bin Laden is there to provide considerable economic assistance. And in turn, of course, he is basically given his run of the country to set up terrorist bases and to operate as he would choose. So there has been a mounting campaign among a variety of Islamist factions in the Middle East. Several of them converge in 1996 as al-Zarahiri and bin Laden merge al-Qaeda and Islamic Jihad and in turn ally themselves with the Taliban, creating now a nation state base for their movement, making them that much more powerful and dangerous. Meanwhile, the direct threat to the United States has become brutally apparent in 1993. In 1993, a plot is carried out through one of the young Arabs who had gone to fight in the Afghan war during the 1980s, a man named Ramzi Youssef. With the support of the Al-Qaeda network, Youssef plans a massive attack on the World Trade Center. A car bomb, a car bomb, a truck bomb that they we they hope will undermine at least one of the towers and bring it crashing down. On February 26, 1993, the bomb goes off. The towers survive despite multiple casualties and fire. The attack is not entirely a surprise. The FBI has had a counter-terrorist unit operating out of New York City for a number of years. CIA has had a counter-terrorist center for more than seven years. And there have been hints, and certainly the attacks in the Middle East gave evidence of a rising threat from Islamist terrorist groups. But when the attack actually comes, there is enormous surprise over the ability of the Islamists to strike such a massive blow within the United States itself. What is more appalling to the FBI, and specifically the head of the FBI office in New York City, is when he learns that Youssef, among others in this plot, was a part of the Afghan Arab contingent that had fought in Afghanistan and that had been trained, however, indirectly by the CIA. In fact, and this is a direct quote from the head of the FBI office in New York at this time, it was, these guys were trained by the CIA. Now, of course, the CIA can deny that and they will be telling the truth. But nevertheless, there was an immediate 
understanding within the intelligence community that indeed the United States was suffering from what's known as blowback from a CIA operation. That the involvement in Afghanistan had led to the training of people who were now putting some of that training to use to attack the United States itself. Yet, even with the attack on the World Trade Center, even with the recognition that much of this could be traced back to the networks that had been created during the Afghan war. The emphasis on fighting terrorism as a direct threat to the United States itself still does not emerge. We now know, of course, in wonderful hindsight, that in less than a decade, the attack on the World Trade Center would be repeated with far more devastating consequences. And yet, in the intervening years, the United States failed to grasp the fact that, well, these groups have been growing in terms of their organizational capabilities. They now have a nation state land base. Ever since the 80s, they have been attacking American targets in the, in the Middle East. And now they have succeeded in striking in the largest city of the United States at a symbol of America's international power. And yet, it has to be said that in the end, the response to that threat in terms of the FBI, the CIA, and the United States government in general was far below what be required if there was going to be any hope of precluding future attacks. And the issue, of course, that has become the dominant issue of debate about national security and intelligence in this country over the last several years is why did that happen? How could it be when you look through these slides and say, my God, you know, <laughs> we help train these people. We know who they are. We know exactly how committed they are and how deep-seated their animosity is. We have the capabilities within the FBI and certainly the CIA to track these people and if not prevent all attacks, at least prevent a catastrophic attack such as the one that occurred on 9-11. And of course, that leaves the issue of then how could this happen? With all of this evidence laid in front of us, how could it possibly be that 9-11 ever occurred? In a couple of minutes, we're going to try to answer that question as best we can at this stage. And we're still, in many ways, too close to the events of 9-11 to come up with complete and final answers. But, as we will see, much of the answer lies in factors that we've already been looking at in the course. Many of the problems that prevented a more coherent and effective response to this mounting threat were embedded in the institutions and the practices of American intelligence gathering and covert operations over the past half century. We've seen some of these problems come up in terms of damaging intervention efforts in various countries. Now, they would become a catastrophic flaw in the defenses of the United States and in the capacities of its intelligence services. We'll come back in a few minutes and see exactly how did all of that evolve and what is the significance.